have at previous events just given a sort of general stump speech the way you might hear from um, most political candidates <laughs> for many different offices. But today I want to talk specifically about something that I am personally very interested in, and that is neighborhood redevelopment. Can we make our neighborhoods better? And I believe that the answer is yes. Um, I've been working, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about downtown today, um, but I am proud of the work I've done for downtown, but I've been doing other stuff too. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been working with the Land Bank Authority, and prior to that, I worked with the Friends of Stokes Park on the uh, redevelopment of the Stokes Park neighborhood. Now, there's still a long ways to go. It's very tough whenever you're working in neighborhoods because there is not a uh, one-size-fits-all solution to neighborhoods. You really have to break it down to each neighborhood on its own because every neighborhood has its own challenges. But there are a few things that apply to all neighborhoods, and I want to talk about those for, for just a second. If you want to improve neighborhoods, there are four things you've got to look at. Number one is services. That's your infrastructure, your water, your gas, your power, your broadband, the basic things that we often take for granted, but those are the first duty of a city government. That's why you establish a city government is to provide services. So if you look at the city of Dublin, $60 million budget, most of it is gonna to go to things like your roads, your uh, water, your gas. I think $16 million out of the $60 million budget the revenues actually come from the gas department. So we cannot forget about the basic duty of the city to provide the infrastructure services to the neighborhoods. So when we talk about budgeting and how the city is gonna to have to prioritize its resources, we have got to be able to maintain the infrastructure that we've already got there and we can't get overextended. If you wanna know how cities go bankrupt, it's whenever they borrow money to extend infrastructure that they don't have the funds to maintain. So we have to be very fiscally responsible in how we develop these neighborhoods. But your streets, and your street lights, and your water and your gas doesn't really make a neighborhood. That's just the foundation part. For a neighborhood, you need other things. And first of all, you have to have safety. Uh, people have to feel secure in their homes, but they also have to feel secure in the streets around their homes. Now, again, the different neighborhoods in Dublin have different needs. In some neighborhoods, they're lucky because their only concern and safety is traffic. It's cars going too fast. That's a huge concern though. So I want to talk about that for a second. My belief is that you either have streets or roads. A street is a place for people. It's a place for families. A street is a place where the neighbors know each other and can go out onto the road or onto the sidewalks and feel protected from traffic. And that's what I think our neighborhood should be. Our neighborhood should be composed of streets. Roads take you from one place to another, usually at a higher speed. And we have to have roads like Hillcrest Parkway. The problem comes where in much of America for the last 50 years, we've tried to merge those concepts of streets and roads together, and we don't get the benefits of either of them. We end up with neighborhoods where the cars go 45 miles per hour, and we have roads where the cars go 45 miles per hour. Everywhere you're going 45 miles per hour and you're not getting the benefit of having a street where families can thrive and you're not having the benefit of the high speed of the high speed roads. There is a way to help this. I think if you're talking about those neighborhoods that have traffic safety issues, you've got to slow down and disincentivize the cars from coming through that neighborhood. You do that by cul-de-sacs, by dead ends, and by looping. And looping is basically to say, there's one entrance, one exit, you can come in one way and go out the other way. Um, what that does is it deters the through traffic. Now, Dublin has a population of about 16,000, but it doubles during the daytime to over 30,000. That's a lot of cars that come here during the daytime for people who don't live in the city. Now, that overstresses the main arteries of the city. So those people then spread out into the neighborhoods where they have that grid system. And during the daytime, you can go down Highland Avenue, you can go down Stonewall. And what you'll see is cars using those as cut throughs and, short, uh, and shortcuts to bypass the main traffic on Highway 80. And what that does is it actually destroys the neighborhoods because the kids can't go outside and play. You can't walk your dogs. 
uh, it becomes a stressful environment where you have the cars constantly going through those neighborhoods. And we can stop that through the design of the streets. And it doesn't have to be expensive, but it can be very effective. Um, now, Phil told me that he went to one Robbins where the mayor there about a decade ago uh, embarked on a program of cul de sac and looping streets and was highly successful in, in setting the stage for revitalizing those neighborhoods. In Dublin, that has been tried recently in the Linda Vista neighborhood, and I think they've been very happy with that uh, because they were able to cut, through, cut out that through traffic that has allowed the families to get back out on the streets. And that's a really important part of building neighborhoods. Other safety issues, other neighborhoods, they would love to have the problem of traffic. Instead, they have the problem of gangs. Now, the, the gangs, the gang violence that happens in some of the neighborhoods, um, is not necessarily affecting the homeowners or the regular citizens of the neighborhood directly. They're not the ones getting shot and killed, but they are in that environment where there are gunshots at night, where there's somebody who across the street has gotten shot. And that creates a sense of insecurity and it destroys any kind of sense of neighborhood that you could have in that area. With the land bank, I worked uh, with Ms. Dudley on Robert Street, uh, trying to help that neighborhood with this dilapidated housing issue. And we cleared out three lots, uh, tore down the homes, re-landscaped around it. We helped a young homeowner buy a home at under market value and renovate it and lives there with his family now. But the last time I was over there, uh, there had been a shooting and a killing across the street from her. So all the work that we had done to try to improve that neighborhood, it pretty much goes out the window if you've got a killing across the street. Now, I'm not an expert on gang violence, but I know that we have got to devote the resources to get that under control or we're not going to be able to protect or we're not going to be able to have healthy neighborhoods. So that has got to be a high priority of the police department. There are other neighborhoods that aren't as concerned about gangs but still have a criminal problem, and it's the petty theft problem. It's the, it's the lawnmower that gets stolen out of the yard. It's the kids' bikes that go missing. It's the house that gets broken into. And you think, well, that's not violent crime, so that's not a big deal. Well, it is a big deal because it destroys the trust that binds a neighborhood together. It destroys the trust that lets you be a community. Um, there are ways to handle that, but let me say this, there are never gonna be enough police to stop that kind of crime because it's often crimes of opportunity. It's people walking by. It's people who see an opportunity and seize it. Uh, and it's not hardened criminals, so they're not going to jail for a long time. They're gonna be back out on the street again. So how do you deter that kind of crime? Well, I think that there's really only a couple ways to do it. One is with the design of the neighborhood. And again, this goes back to the traffic issue about reducing the through traffic. You can reduce the pedestrian through traffic with the same way that you reduce the traffic, the traffic that, that goes through that doesn't belong in the neighborhood. I believe that we should take all the different neighborhoods in Dublin, define them, set their boundaries and limits, and let people know this is the two or three block area that you are a part of. And you have to work together to keep this area safe. Now we have neighborhood watches in Dublin. The problem with those neighborhood watches is the borders are uncertain. They're ambiguous. They extend this way, they extend that way. And people don't really know which neighborhood they belong to, which group are they affiliated with. So it's gotta get much smaller. We need micro neighborhoods. We need two or three blocks that band together and say, we are going to work to patrol this area as a small micro neighborhood. Now, that means that you've gotta have limited entrance and exit to those areas. And there's some street design that has to be done. But I also was talking with Chief Chapman about one of their most successful programs, which is the Eagle Eye program, it's security cameras. The problem that they have with the security cameras that are that are handled by the police department or owned by the police department is that you have to pay people to watch them, to watch the footage. And so they're looking at retired police officers maybe to come in and watch the footage. Well, here's another idea, and I'm not saying that this is a silver bullet, I'm just throwing it out there. 
Um, at our house, we have a, a, a video security system that is on the front porch, and it covers our front porch and the sidewalk in front of our porch. What if instead of the government having police cameras in public places that are watched by police officers, we had a grant program that if you formed a small micro neighborhood and you wanted to have a neighborhood watch, that they would also give you a grant that each person in that neighborhood could get funds to have their own security camera with the only provision being that they had to share the footage with the police in the case of a crime then you would be able to have private people watching their own security cameras. And I can tell you, it's a little bit addictive. Yeah, I don't know if any of you actually have a security <laughs> camera or not, but sometimes you can just flip it on when you're at work and see what's going on. It's kind of interesting to see what's happening around your house. Um, I didn't realize that we had so many cats in our neighborhood. We did. <laughs> We've got lots of cats. But we see them on the security cameras. But the point is that you're letting people, you're, you're outsourcing that from the government to the people. And the people are always way more effective. You're never going to have enough police officers. we got to take personal responsibility. Now, the government can help with this grant program, especially in neighborhoods where people maybe can't afford their own security system. And I think that that acts as a force multiplier for the police. You know, right now, we have funding for more police officers than we can actually hire. So how are we going to take those roughly 150 police officers and make it seem like or feel like or get the effectiveness of 300 or 500 police officers. Well, you can do that with security cameras primarily because you can have one person watching multiple places so it cuts down your actual human, uh, the, the cost of your, of your labor for all those additional police officers. There are other little tricks that you can use, of course, like if you've got police cars that are not in use because um, you know maybe it's not a full ship, you park them in a prominent place and put a dummy in them. I know that that sounds a little bit ridiculous, but just the visual appearance of it uh, reduces crime. I'll tell you this, from my experience in the criminal justice system, um, I don't think that criminals are deterred by long prison sentences. Uh, I think that the only thing that a criminal is deterred by is the possibility of being caught in that moment, right? Because they're not thinking ahead. They're not saying, is, what's the difference between six months in jail and nine months in jail, or the difference between one year in jail or two years in jail. They're thinking, what's the difference of me getting away with this um, head trimmer that I'm trying to steal versus me getting caught? So the point where you deter crime is at the point that it can occur. And you do that through the appearance of police, uh, the appearance that police are there. So you have to project more power than you maybe actually have. So we've got to make our 150 police officers feel like a thousand police officers, and they've got to be supplemented by the people taking responsibility for their own safety as well. So we talk about safety in terms of these police actions, in terms of traffic, in terms of, of petty thievery, and in terms of gangs. But there's two other elements of, of, of safety that people don't, often think of as being fundamental, but I believe they are. And one of those is beauty. People think that beauty is an add-on, that it's that extra thing that you get after you have a good neighborhood. Uh, I think that's totally wrong. I think beauty is the thing that allows you to have a good neighborhood. Um, beauty is the thing that makes you feel connected to the place that you're in. It's the thing that makes you want to invest more where you live. Beauty is fundamental to a neighborhood. Beauty is fundamental to community. Are you gonna have a good neighborhood if there's a rundown, broken house next to you? Are you gonna have a good neighborhood if there's trash all over the yard? Are you gonna have a good neighborhood if people leave use mattresses out on the street? I mean, the answer of course is no. And whenever you put it in terms of the opposite of beauty, if you know that ugliness leads to bad things, then surely you know that beauty leads to good things too. So efforts to beautify, to plant trees, uh, to clean up trash, to tear down broken houses, you got to do those things almost first to set the stage to have strong neighborhoods. So, you know, when we talk about how you budget money for the city, I think that, that you cannot, I, I've seen it a hundred times in every plan that is put forth for any type of government project, you have the, the sort of infrastructure that goes in first, and then you've got the the building improvements, and the last thing is the landscaping. So what's the first thing that always gets cut when there's a budget problem? 
is the landscaping. So you end up with a sidewalk with no trees. Now, I'm going to ask you how many people have walked in July in Dublin on a sidewalk with no trees? And the answer is none. We've got miles of sidewalk that are unused in this town because it's just too hot. Uh, so, you know, it, it sounds silly, but you got to have trees, you got to have the landscape, and you got to have the beauty. As a matter of fact, there's a, a picture over there I brought. It was the landscaping uh, guidelines for the Stubbs Park neighborhood. Now, when I was on the uh, Friends of Stubbs Park board, and there are people here that were on that board as well, we talked about what we could do to improve this neighborhood. And one of the first things that we did was say, we need a tree plan. We need a, 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 a plan for planting trees. And um, I was very happy. If you look over here, there's a, there's about a dozen trees that the Friends of Stubbs Park planted in this area. Um, and we also paid Thomas and Hutton to come up with a tree planting guideline to tell us the appropriate species, uh, what size the tree should be and where they could be planted. And I think that was money well spent. And we've got to, we can't cut this kind of thing out of, out of the budget. Beauty has got to be fundamental if we want to improve the neighborhood. And I know I'm talking a long time. I appreciate you guys hanging with me uh, for this sort of long presentation, but I feel very passionate about it. And now that brings us to the last thing, which is community. And again, community is really the heart of what we're trying to get to here, but it also feeds in to all the other things. If you want to have safety, you have to have community. You've got to know and trust your neighbors. And to know and trust your neighbors, you've got to know the boundaries of your neighborhood. And, and it's one of those things is you're either going to have fences and bars, fences around your house and bars on your window, or you can have a neighborhood that has its own boundary. And it's far better to be in a neighborhood with its own boundary so that everybody within those boundaries are people that you know and trust. And whenever you get to that point, you really start getting a sense of community. And once you get to that point of having a sense of community, amazing things are possible because when people start working together with a vision of how their area, how their lives and the lives of the people they're connected to can be better, you end up, that's really where you get the greatness of civilization. So we can talk about this in terms of potholes in the street. We can talk of it in terms of street lights. We can talk of it in terms of dilapidated houses that need to be turned down. But really, at the end of the day, the reason we're doing all this is to increase the quality of life and try to make our culture and our civilization something that we can be proud of. I appreciate you hanging out here with me for a few minutes this afternoon. And uh, as you know, I am running for mayor, and I would appreciate <laughs> your support in that as well. Thank you for your time.